Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I am Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you tonight. I trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting and may you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we ask you for your blessing over the word. We ask the Holy Spirit for enlightenment and understanding. Help us to live by your word in order that we may please you. We also remember all those, O oh Lord, who are affected by this pandemic that's going around the world. We ask for divine healing for them. And we also ask you that you will uncover for us a cure for this. Help us, Lord, and strengthen us in this difficult time that we will go through this. And Lord, with your strength, we ask these mercies in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Welcome once again. It's my pleasure to be with you. Sorry we're a little bit late, you know, technical difficulties, but we are back online. Tonight I want to talk to you about the invitation. And our reading is taken from the book, second book of Samuel, chapter 9 and verses 3 to 7. Second Samuel 9, 3 to 7. And the Lord said, sorry, and the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of God to him. And Ziba, who was a servant to King David, said, There is still a son of Jonathan, and he is crippled in his feet. And then King David said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Maki, the son of Amiel, at Lodebar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Maki, the son of Amiel, at Lodebar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore you to all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Praise God. I want you to picture this tonight. I want you to picture this great hall of the palace of King David. It is the dining hall of the king of, of Judah. And the king walks in and he takes his seat at the head of the long dining table in this huge dining hall. His wives, his sons and daughters who are standing at their places behind their chairs now seat themselves at the table. Young Solomon, who is quite an inquisitive little chappy and very intelligent, notices an empty seat with a place setting near the king, and he wonders who the guest might be. He is just about to ask his father when a strange sound draws his attention. It sounds like the tapping of wood on the floor, followed by a softer dragging sound. It sounds like footsteps, but there's something not quite right about it. The others have heard it as well, and all eyes turn toward the doorway as the sound draws nearer, and then the sound takes shape. A crippled young man walking on crutches. He stops in the doorway to catch his breath, and he looks around the room nervously. King David smiles at the young man and beckons him to come sit at the seat next to him. The young man hobbles to the table and with some difficulty takes the empty seat and he leans his crutches against the table. All eyes are on him and he feels the heat of the stairs. Then King David announces, Family, I want you all to meet Prince Mephibosheth, son of my friend Jonathan and grandson of King Saul. He will be part of this family from now on. I want you all to join me in welcoming him, in welcoming him to the house, to the royal house of David. David bows his head, he blesses the meal, and they all begin to eat. Praise God. Mephibosheth was a cripple. And he was crippled when his father Jonathan and grandfather King Saul died in battle. His nurse was afraid that the enemy will come and try and kill Mephibosheth. So she 
grabbed him and she started to run out of the palace. But somewhere in her running, she dropped him and she dropped him from quite a good height because when he fell, he hurt his legs and he was crippled and he couldn't walk anymore. This reminds us of mankind. Mankind, when we run from, from Satan sometimes, and sometimes even when we run from God, we, have, we fall and we become crippled. When we ran out of the Garden of Eden, when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, we fell and we became crippled. And that is how man has been after that, spiritually crippled. And so Mephibosheth kept away from David. Remember, Saul hated David. Saul wanted to kill David. On, on few occasions, he tried to kill David. And Mephibosheth was sure that if David found out about him, he would kill him for his grandfather's sins. We have inherited sin from our forefathers, from Adam and Eve. And we hide from God because we know that God is against sin. We know that God is against sin. But I want to talk about a twist in the tale today. Mephibosheth ran away from David. He lived in exile in the house of Mekir in Lodabar because he was afraid that the king, if he found, found him alive, will, take, will kill him. As a cripple, he was going nowhere. He was going nowhere until an invitation from King David came that would change his life forever. We as men, as crippled men, spiritually crippled, are going nowhere. And we, had, we were going nowhere until Jesus came and offered us salvation. And when Jesus died and gave us his salvation, we had some place to go. Mephibosheth had no hope of a better life. He had to leave the palace and live on, on someone else's charity. Everything that they had, everything that belonged to King Saul and to Prince Jonathan was gone. It was gone. It belonged to the new king. And Mephibosheth was in exile and he lived in the house of Machir. He had lost everything with no hope of restoration. And tonight some of us here as human beings fallen from grace crippled by sin we have no hope of restoration but tonight i want to tell you something i have news for you there is hope of restoration to god there is, is hope of reconciliation back to the lord jesus christ the is a cripple and a poor one at that he was born into a royal house and now a servant not much more than a servant life had dealt him lemons and he didn't know how to make lemonade Mephibosheth is in Lodibar, which means nothing. He had gone from the palace of Saul to a place called nothing. We have come from the glory of God into a place of desolation, spiritual desolation. Not only was he going nowhere, he was now a nothing. But the good news I want to talk to you about is the heart of a king, the heart of a good king. A cripple needs someone to help him to his feet. The cripple battle to walk, but they need somebody to pick them up and help them. Give them a shoulder to lean on. And like I said, man was crippled by sin and needed a savior to come to the rescue. A savior to give them a shoulder to, to hold on to. To pull him out of the rut that he was in. Sin is a crippling disease of the soul that destroys all hope. It keeps one away from God. But luckily for us, fortunately for us, it couldn't keep God away from us. Sin might keep you away from God, but sin cannot keep God away from you. It could not keep God away from you. Jesus came to earth as a man, as a God man. He was down on earth. He was 100% man and 100% God. We won't know. We don't understand that mathematics. But when we go to heaven, we'll understand the dimensions of Jesus and Jesus when he was on earth he was a hundred percent man and he was a hundred percent God he wasn't a sinful man like some people say let me tell you that he was God and he was God in the form of man and nothing could keep God away from us David was the soul mate of Jonathan now Jonathan was Mephibosheth's father and if you go to the book of 
1 Samuel chapter 20 and read verses 14 and 15, you will find how close they were. And there was a covenant that they made. And it says here in 14 of 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14. But show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. That is Jonathan talking to David and making a covenant to David not to harm him or his family. And he calls David, he doesn't call David my friend, he talks to him like the third person, David, because he knew David was going to be the king. Tonight, the Lord Jesus wants to make a covenant with us. He wants to make a covenant with us, a covenant to take care of us, to protect us, that we will not die. And David and Jonathan had this friendship. And now David remembers this friendship. He may, be, he may have lay on his bed many a night thinking about Jonathan because he was now the king. Jonathan was dead. The previous king Saul, Jonathan's father was dead. And David was determined to keep his side of the covenant. God made a covenant with you and he is determined to keep that covenant. And he said to his servant, he said, is there anybody left from the house of Saul? Because I want to show kindness to them for the sake of Jonathan. And Ziba, who was a servant of Mephibosheth and Saul, he came to David and he said, yes, there is one. There is one, one left. There is one of Jonathan's sons, but he is crippled. He made sure he tells him that he is crippled. Ziba was a person who was devious. Ziba wanted, was expecting retribution. He expected David to, dis, to find Mephibosheth and kill him. And that way he would become, would come into the favor of David. But David takes care of Mephibosheth. He invites him to his dinner table. He invites him to his palace. And he says to him, my grace will cover you. And he brings him in and he tells his family, this is now one of us. He is one of us. Remember the verse in, first, in, the, in the book of Songs of Solomon. He brought me into his banqueting uh, hall and his banner over me is love. Like God saves us for Jesus' sake. David saved Mephibosheth for Jonathan's sake. Mephibosheth might have expected death. He might have been fearful. But he was surprised to hear when the king reassured him because he was receiving unmerited favor. And unmerited favor is what we call grace. David not only gave him grace and mercy, David adopted him and he restored him to royalty. He felt unworthy and indeed he was so. But Jonathan's intercession cleared the path for a new life. We need some Jonathans tonight. Are you a Jonathan who is prepared to intercede for your family? Jonathan intercede, interceded for his sons long before he died. And now we talk about the invitation. The invitation is the title of tonight's message. David invited Mephibosheth to his table, to his house and into his family. The outcast has become a royal insider. His family record has been expunged, expunged and he is a prince once again. And he asks the king, because he cannot believe this, he asks the king, why would you be so gracious to me who, are ju who is just a dead dog to you? He said, I'm a dead dog. I have no hope. I have nothing to offer you, king. Why would you be gracious? And I ask myself that question myself. When I look at Jesus' love for me and I say, why would Jesus love us? We were dead in our trespasses. We were nothing more than dead dogs. We not even were to be the fleas fleeing a dead dog. But Jesus loved us. What love has the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Hallelujah to his name. Mephibosheth gets called as a son of David. He puts him into his family. 
And in 2 Samuel 7, 18 said, David said the same words, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? David had been there and he understood Mephibosheth's emotions. And David goes on and invites him. David once sat at Saul's table and nearly lost his life. Yet he allows Saul's grandson to sit at his own table and his life is assured. That is how it is with us. We might have been sitting at the devil's table and we were heading for, for death. But Jesus has brought us to his table and our life is assured. We eat at his table and our lives are assured. The king initiated this redemption. Have you noticed that? It wasn't Mephibosheth looking for the king. It was King David reaching down for him. It's just like with us. We had nothing. Many, many teachings tell you that you need to reach out to God. You need to do something. Then you can eventually become one with God. No. Our God, Jehovah, Yahweh says, I will reach down to you. He re reached down to us. He reached out to us and he rescued us. The rescue of Mephibosheth cost David the price of Saul's land because he gave Mephibosheth all his grandfather's land back. And that was land that now belonged to David. So that was David's price to pay. But our salvation cost God the life of his only son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can I hear an amen there tonight? Mephibosheth lived in the favor of David. We shall live in the presence of God. The lame lost sheep, Mephibosheth, had was given a home. He was found. The sheep that was lost was found. David left everybody else, the 99 that were in his fold, and he went to find that one. The saved will inherit a home in heaven because the Lord says he goes after that one sheep that's lost. And then you find David not only gave him grace, he gave him mercy. In 2 Samuel 21, he talks about David, some of, Saul's, uh, some of Saul's descendants were marked for death. They were going to be executed for, what, for whatever crime they did. Probably because they were Saul's descendants. But David steps in, he intervenes, and he saves Mephibosheth's life. Because Mephibosheth was now David's son. We were heading for death. And Jesus stepped in and he said, hang on. This, this person belongs to my family. Leave him alone. That is salvation. It's time to take Jesus' invitation seriously. He showed us his love on the cross. King David flees from Absalom. Everybody knows the story. David's son revolted against him and King David has to leave the castle for his own safety. He's quite old now. He's no more the fighter that he was. And he starts walking out of there. He didn't even have a donkey to walk or uh, to, to ride. And as he leaves the palace somewhere along the road, he meets Ziba, the same servant who was Mephibosheth's servant. Because David had told him, you must serve Mephibosheth like you served his grandfather. And he comes there and he tells David that Mephibosheth, he's sitting back in, in, in Jerusalem and he's waiting to take over the throne. He came up with a conspiracy about Ziba. I'm uh, sorry, about Mephibosheth. This Ziba was conspiring to take over Saul's property because he knew that if David kills Mephibosheth, then legally he would in inherit Mephibosheth's uh, lands. But David eventually, and David he, he eventually comes back to Jerusalem. But when he comes back to Jerusalem, one of the first people, if not the first one to meet him, is the crippled Mephibosheth. He is unkempt. He hasn't been, he, he looks like he hasn't shaven his beard in all those months. His clothes are untidy and dirty. He was obviously in mourning. And when David queries it, he says he was mourning because the king had left Jerusalem and he was waiting for David to come back. But old David is not, he's very confused. He's quite confused. Even though he hears the truth, he believes that there might be a conspiracy. And on a balance of prob probabilities, he makes a compromise 
and he divides the land, Saul's land, between Mephibosheth and Ziba. He says, you take half and you take half, because I don't know who's speaking the truth. David didn't consult God then, but he didn't know who was speaking the truth. And Mephibosheth says something that you need to really keep in your mind today. And always remember, he said to, to King David, he said, King David, my king, I don't want the land. You can give it all to Ziba. All I want is to sit at your table, to sit in your presence. That means more than all the lands of my grandfather. Mephibosheth chose David's presence over his presence. He took his presence. He wanted to be with him rather than take his material gifts. Remember Mary and Martha? Mary chose the better part. She chose Jesus' company, Jesus' presence over everything else. She didn't care that her sister was, was uh, complaining about her. She said, I'm going to sit with Jesus as long as he's with, he's with us. I'm going to be in his presence. Martha had lots of other things in her mind. Who are you tonight? Mary or Martha? Will, will you be like Mephibosheth would say, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd ha rather have Jesus than riches untold. Ziba stated that Mephibosheth was a cripple. I told you, he emphasized it. But David ignored that. He saw what he could do for Mephibosheth and not what Mephibosheth could do to him, do for him. You see, Ziba thought a cripple is useless. What can he give the king? I'm a servant. I can do more because I've got my hands and feet all work. But David ignored him because David saw what he could do for Mephibosheth and not what Mephibosheth could do for him. That's how it's with God. God is not looking at what you can do to, for him by becoming one in his family. He was looking for what he could do for you. And what he could do for you was save you. Even when we were crippled by sin, Jesus looked past our handicaps, past our sins, and did what he could do for us. He gave his life so that we can live. That is why now we should serve him. David's son was Absalom. David's own son, Absalom, became his enemy. But Mephibosheth, who was the enemy, became his son. That is reconciliation. That is the essence of salvation. We who were enemies with, to God have now become his sons. Hallelujah. We who were his enemies have become his children, his sons, his daughters. We who didn't have any, want to have anything to do with him. He reached out to us and now we have joined his family and we are royalty. Hallelujah. I want to clap. I want to dance. John 1.11 said, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But then he came to us and we received him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to tell you a little story as I'm rounding up. And it's, it's about the emperor's gener generosity. The emperor's generosity. There was once a poor wretched man who supported himself by sitting by the roadside and begging from passing travelers. He had nothing. He lived somewhere under the trees or on the streets. But he begged. And he usually ended his day with a few coins, usually just enough to buy bread. And sometimes he could buy a little more. One day as he sat in his usual spot by the roadside, two well-dressed riders on beautiful steeds rode by. And as they came closer, he held out his hands expectantly for the few, for the usual few mites or few coins or the occasional bronze coin thrown to him, thrown at him by rich folk. He noticed that rich folk did not give as much as one would expect. That's true even nowadays. They don't give much as one would expect them. They don't give according to what they have. But he was taken, taken by surprise when one of the riders threw him several gold coins. He couldn't believe his luck. He had never received such a generous gift before. Gold coins, not copper, not even bronze or not even silver. These were gold. Wow. As he scrambled to pick up the coins, 
he thanked the stranger repeatedly. He kept repeating, thank you, sir, thank you. And he was so happy and he, and he couldn't actually tear himself. He couldn't decide whether to look at the stranger or to pick up the coins. Well, the coins eventually won over and he picked them up. That stranger was Alexander the Great. The beggar had no claim on him. The beggar had no right to ask Alexander anything or even to expect anything from him. Yet the emperor threw him several gold coins. Alexander's riding companion was astonished at his generosity and he commented, he said, Sir, a few copper coins would adequately meet a beggar's need. Why do you give him gold? Why gold? Alexander answered in royal fashion and he said, Copper coins would suit the beggar's need, but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. Hallelujah. It's the same with the, our Lord Jesus. He owed us nothing. We shouldn't expect anything from him. He didn't have to die for us, but he did. He didn't have to die. He didn't have to give us anything, let alone his life. But he did it anyway, anyway, because copper coins may suit a beggar's need, but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. God could have given us a little, but he gave us a lot to show us how much he loves us. It's not about how, we, how much we love him. It's about how much he loves us. You've heard how an undeserving cripple received the undeserved generosity and even the adoption of a king. How someone who was stripped of all dignity and all material wealth was invited to dine at the table of the king as a son of the king. A man who was nothing, Lodibar, was promoted to royalty. Tonight, I deliver to you an invitation from another king. This invitation comes from the King of Kings. King Jesus is his name. He wants you to join him at his table in the royal dining hall in heaven. It will cost you nothing. Just a simple, yes, Lord, I accept you. I accept your invitation. I live for you. Don't be afraid because you're a cripple tonight. Don't be afraid of your sin. The cripple, the cripple part refers to your sin. Don't be afraid because listen to this. If you look at me, you'll see what I'm telling you. When you sit at his table, the table of Jesus, the tablecloth of grace will cover your lame feet. No one will see. No one will see that you're crippled. Your crippleness is covered. His presence is his grace will cover your sin. I trust you have enjoyed God's word tonight. I pray that it has brought conviction and in time it will bring change and commitment. And again I say as there is no copyright, you may preach, copy and distribute this message as you may, as you may wish to. Remember to join us again on Sunday at 10 a.m. Same time, same place. This is Pastor Simon. And as always, it has been my pleasure and my honor to speak to you and to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. Till next time, God bless.